They, they have to lower the sugar content in Iron Brew because um, it, well, it wasn't going to meet like the latest UK standards and I think all the other soft drinks did. And then, so they, they did like new Iron Brew that wasn't as sugary and then like a black market in Iron Brew developed because people were finding like pallets of it and like shut down news agents and stuff and like selling it on eBay. <laughs> and then they brought it back as some sort of like Iron Brew Extra. Forget the details. Didn't it have to like, be registered as like an energy drink or something? Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, they, they, yeah it was, it's technically like car fuel or something rather than <laughs> drink. Like, yeah. How, how much do people actually it. drink our brew? Is it? Yeah, a reasonable amount. I, I think more than Coke. I, right. I, you would need to fact check this. I think only in Scotland and Russia does another soft drink outsell Coke. I That's think. amazing. I is it one of those ones where you, you know, people are in the pub, you know, if they don't want a beer? Yeah, well, actually, yeah, yeah. We're in Scotland, so everyone will have a beer. You just go for an iron brew. <laughs> but do they have an iron brew? Yeah, for sure. And yeah, big hangover thing. You you just, you'd have it like you would a Coke, but a lot of people will drink it instead of Coke. Is there a lot of pride around it? Like, no, it's, it's low key. No no one's, yeah, you're not going up to the bar and being like, for freedom, you know? But <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just a nice drink. I should have brought some. I don't iron brew and fry, fried Mars bars. Deep fried heroin. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't mind iron brew. I like iron brew. Oh, right. iron brew. Yeah. So it's you nice. had porridge for breakfast. Yeah, I did. Yeah. You're so fucking Scottish. No iron brew though, yeah. <laughs> I got the whiskey as well. Do you want to, should we bust that open? Yeah, what, have, what wanted, have you brought us? So I've got, I, I wanted to do something special because I, very I kind. contacted you guys to kind of say thanks. So I got you, it's a coolie lot. I've basically done that thing where I got you a gift that's actually something I want. So <laughs> Wow. I so got, I have to share it. So we're not going to open it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. This looks like a good bottle of whiskey. I hope so. I, Isn't that nice? Someone's brought me a bottle of whiskey back from Scotland. Very cool. Yeah. I, I got it because it's from 2008 and I wanted to do something that was all oh, that's quite cool. So, because I, I, think, I think it's incredible. We don't know who Satoshi is. And I thought this was a little bit of a way to kind of connect with that part of history. So right. when this was distilled, Satoshi was writing the code and putting the finishing touches on the white paper, right? Love that. This is a... This don't, I'm, I'm not asking, so please don't answer or give me an answer, but it looks expensive. It does look expensive. It looks like you've treated it. And it's strong. It's like 60%. Like Fucking hell. I'm, Whiskey I'm, shouldn't necessarily be expensive because it, it was like a pauper's drink and it's for everyone. I, so. I have to drive, so I'm going to have a taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've already had a taste with Freddie like this It's like 60% as well because it's single cask and cask strength. So, Daddy, you open it so I can concentrate. Right. Uh, thank you. That's very kind of you. So we are always looking for new people to come onto the podcast because it can get a bit samey, the same people. Like, I love Alex Gustin, but we talk a lot about human rights. I love Preston Pish, love Lynn. love having all these people on again. But it's always interesting for us when we find new people who uh, who haven't been on the show before. Did you hear the nuclear show we made last year, the guy in Tennessee? Yeah, 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 that was cool. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, and it's all, we, we're desperate for it. And so I can't remember, when did you send us the email? Oh, a couple of months back. Yeah, Jan, Jan, Feb. So you drop us this email. Mm. Did I can't remember the detail because I usually forward it on to Danny. Yeah. Did you send it with the idea of coming on the show or were you just trying to tell us something? I was just trying to tell you something because I do, apart from my, my poor wife, I, I don't really know many people into Bitcoin. And yeah, please. I kind of hit this big personal milestone that's been the result of like 12 years work. So I, I got into it in 2012 and I've been, I've been wow. trying to like unfuck myself from the fiat economy since then. And I, I kind of hit my, my goal. And I, I just kind of thought like, I've got to do something about this. And, and like, I wrote to you because your podcast had brought so much knowledge to me. So well, Slange, the, the thank you. Slange, is that yeah. what you say? Yeah. All right, slange. Slange to you. Slange. What does uh, that mean? Cheers, obviously. It just means cheers. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Strong. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I can't right, have too see much you on the other it. side. Yeah. I, hope, I hope the podcast goes well, guys. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> One shot, no, no longer nervous. <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, any email that comes in is a potential of someone to come on the show. The fact that you've never done a podcast before is fascinating. We've got no idea how this is therefore going to go because mm. we, we we don't know what we we can't hear previous shows with you. But certainly, you've piqued our interest with. Well, look, I'll let you tell the story of your career, what you what you do, and and cool. um, you know why this led to you writing to us and the connection to Bitcoin. Sure. Um, so you're you're a systems engineer, but specifically with fighter jets. Uh, yeah, well, aerospace, and I've, I've done I've done a few things. I did I started out in uh, in missiles and rockets. I was literally a rocket scientist for for about four years, and I moved into consulting on big infrastructure projects, mostly railway. 
So I was down in London for that. I lived in London for like 10 years. So, okay. so I was working on like big rail projects for most of that. And now I'm, now I'm back in aerospace up in Edinburgh. Where I'm doing fighter jet stuff, yeah. Okay. And what's your, what do you specifically do in that area? So it's always, as soon as I start explaining what a systems engineer is, that's normally when people shut down. I think I can kind of keep people awake by pointing out to Bitcoiners that we, we've got two really prominent ones in Bitcoin. So Michael Saylor and Lynn Alden were both systems engineers. I, yeah. I think they were both systems engineers in aerospace, actually. So, you know, it could be a coincidence, but... Are you, think, but you basically saying you're the uh, you're the third smartest. Yeah, basically. you're part of that team. Well, I'm saying I I, I saw it before they did, so I don't know. <laughs> third smartest, I would say maybe the first. Other way. Maybe we What's need to words? get Sailor, Lynn, and Nick in the room together. Just fight, just yeah. fight. I mean, I'll, I'll see. I'll look at my schedule. I'll see if I have time. <laughs> no promises. Um, but yeah, so what, what we do, like, if you're going to design a really complex system, so like like a fighter jet or a rocket or a car or something, you need uh, you basically need a bunch of engineers who are domain experts. So you would need your like mechanical engineers, like electronic, software engineers, aerodynamics, propulsion, blah, blah, blah. And they're all really good at what they do. But you need someone to tie it all together because if you imagine, if you were going to build a car and you you got a bunch of like pistons and spark plugs and, and wheels and like gearbox and stuff and you just threw it in a pile, it wouldn't do anything. It would just be an inert pile of stuff and um, it's because there's this thing that systems engineers call emergent behavior in complex systems that happens not from the individual components but when you connect them together and it becomes kind of greater than the sum of its parts so if you if you take that pile of car parts and you engineer it together the right way you have a vehicle something that drives and that's an emergent behavior it's not because of any one component or any one part of the design it's something that exists at a higher level Right. Ah, hold yeah. on. I don't want to jump ahead, and certainly let's not get into this. But I think you're basically saying that this is what Satoshi did. We had all these different jigs parts. Of the, I always call it the jigsaw puzzle. He finally put it together. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That was that was how I how I first. I, I kind of want to. I want to. I want to give like context before yeah. I get to this, but like yes, absolutely, Bitcoin has huge emergent behavior, as as does the economy. And um, another, if you're doing something really complex, the emergent behavior becomes the dominant factor. Like if you, the best example is a human brain, right? Mm -hmm. It's just it's a lump of fat, it's a lump of neurons. And if you look at one neuron, it doesn't tell me anything about you. If you just stack them up, it doesn't do anything. It's the connection between them that. You get this amazing emergent behavior of like intelligence and consciousness. So there comes a point if if you're building something complex enough, the emergent behavior is is the dominant factor. It's significantly bigger than any of the secondary um, attributes that that thing has, right? So that's that's a huge part of my job because when you're when you're building like a fighter jet or a rocket, it's just a, it's just a couple of tons of aluminium, and it's it's mostly the, the engineering and a lot of it's the systems engineering that that makes it do amazing things, right? And um, so that that's kind of my day job. Uh, but, but what specifically are you doing? Like I'm interested in the specifics of a fighter jet. What do you specifically do? I, I can't I can't talk about it. Oh, okay, awesome. But, well, I, I can't talk about the details, but I I can tell you like what what we'll tend to do is we'll model the the components. So whether it's you know like the engines, the radar, the the wings, the control system, the hydraulics, blah blah blah, you will model them as a network. You you'll capture every state that it could possibly be in, and you'll capture how it relates to the other systems. So you know you often have the output of one system as the input for another. So on your car, the output of the engine goes to the gearbox. It's the input for the gearbox. The output for the gearbox is the input for the clutch. Output the clutch is the input to the wheels, right? You've got a kind of domino effect between the systems. So a lot of what we'll do, when that gets complex, you get a lot more emergent behavior. You got a lot more ways that things could go wrong. Because you don't, in a complex system, you don't just get the positive emergent behavior that you wanted. You get unexpected stuff, like a car has handling, right? It feels a certain way. It it has a it has a character to it that wasn't you you can't point at a specific component and explain like that little thing there explains why your car handles that way. It's, mm -hmm. it's the sum of the whole thing. So we try and we try and model this thing um, like as as a network of nodes, all the inputs and outputs and states. Try and optimize for the good emergent behaviors that you want, and you try and eliminate the bad ones. 
because you do get negative emergent behaviors as well. Errors, essentially. Things. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's interesting. Let, let me give you an example. So 737 MAX? Uh, yeah, well, like generally any, any kind of like modern engineering disaster is probably going to be because of something like that. The, the mm. days of just like a bit of metal snapping and that causing a disaster are over. Like we, we design stuff much better than that. It tends to be a really weird combination of circumstances that, that finds a behavior in the system that no one thought about, right? Um, a really simple example, like you're, you're into rock music, right? Love it. You know, feedback on a electric guitar. Yes. That was that an accident. That's an emergent behavior because you like it, it goes in a feedback loop, right? Like yeah. the, the output of the speaker, it vibrates the strings, it gets sent round in a loop, and then it, it goes exponential, dominates the system. Nothing's broken, right? Your electric guitar is working fine. It's, it's the way someone designed it. The amplifier works fine, the speaker works fine. You connect them together under certain circumstances, and you have this emergent behavior of the feedback thing. So I, I, I want to stress like the, the critical difference is it's not about finding out what happens when a component breaks. It finds out what happens like when the system is working. Are there conditions where it can descend into dysfunction, even if everything is still working? Interesting thing about that is that if you're a classical music concert, they would not want the feedback loop. Yeah. But if you're going to a Slayer, you probably do want it. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I guess like there's no way of getting out of it, so we so we adapt it. But so so one so I'm re really interested. I I I I hate flying. Right. I hate flying. Daddy knows this. It's just just not a fan of it. Mm -hmm. Um. Interestingly, I've watched every pretty much every single episode of Air Crash Investigation. <laughs> and the reason I like... You want to understand, right? Yeah, yeah. So I understand all the redundancy systems, all the things they've built, they've learned, they've understood via every single crash that's happened, which has changed the way they engineer aircraft. And I find that super fascinating. That's why we get to the point now, it's really unusual to have a plane crash. Mm. It shouldn't essentially happen. Yeah. It's, and, and when it does, it's usually now pilot error. Because or air traffic control error, because the systems are so robust. Yeah, or terrorism. It's, it's mostly <coughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's human, humans. Humans. Yeah. Exactly. My, my dad was an aircraft engineer, and he he said, eventually we won't have pilots because that's where the errors are now. Yeah. They're yeah. human errors. Uh, speaking like very broadly, we we kind of got away from basically any one like kind of physical failure of being able to bring down a plane. We kind of got away from that in the 70s and the 80s. There's basically now nothing that can break on a plane. There's no weather that can hit it. There's no one failure that, that could ever bring it down. So it now either has to be like a human doing something they really shouldn't, or it has to be like some really bizarre set of circumstances that, that no one thought about. And, and that's kind of part of my day job. And so within your job, are, are you, are you, I mean, you're trying to, Prepare for, hmm, I'm not sure even sure how to word this. Okay, so, because I'm in my head, there's, you've, we've essentially just talked about unknown unknowns. You can't yeah. prepare for unknown unknowns mm. unless you test for unknown unknowns. Yeah. Um, but are you looking for an emergent behavior that can be a benefit and also looking for emergent behavior that can be catastrophic? Yeah. Is it both? Yeah, because they tend to happen at the same time. Like, right. like once you a system of a certain complexity will take on a life of its own. <clears throat> These things will develop without you necessarily putting them in there deliberately. Let me uh, let me give you an example. Um, so my my car's got like smart cruise control, right? And it, it's a simple system, right? It can just use the accelerator and the brake. It can, it's got a radar sensor in the front, so it follows the cars in front. It's got a little camera in the windscreen that looks for speed limit signs that tell it, it sticks to the local speed limit. So that's really just four simple components. You, you network them together, you have an emergent behavior of a car that drives itself on the motorway, right? So that's really good. And that's, that's a good bit of systems engineering to make it work from these simple components. But there's, there's a negative emergent behavior on, on my car because, so you know in the UK, like big vehicles like buses, they're speed limited for safety. And there's usually a sticker like slapped mm -hmm. on the back saying this bus is limited to 60. So if I'm if I'm using cruise control and I try and overtake a bus, it'll see that, think it'll mistake it for a local speed limit sign, and it'll break me down to the same speed as the bus right as I try and overtake it. So that is, again, nothing's broken, right? Nothing's broken in the car. It is just the, the complexity of like the real world and that system means there's this emergent behavior of, on the one hand, my car mostly drives itself in the motorway. On the other hand, it can't overtake buses. And the guys at Toyota didn't think of that, you know? So they missed that. But would that, that's now something they would essentially work on? 
Yeah, I, I think ideally you would have to. Like it's because it is it, it's a bit dangerous. It's it's not something I want to happen. So it's not it it shouldn't be there. And and I guess no one no one intentionally put it there, but at the same time, no one spotted it in advance. So so I would try and spot that stuff in advance. So your your point about the unknown unknowns, you can't truly know unknown unknowns, obviously. No, but you you discover them through testing. Yeah, if if you model this stuff out and, and figure out like every possible permutation of how the system could work, you you can find these like strange runaway behaviors or these these weird conditions that will create like a, a, a negative behavior in the system. And depending on what you're working on system project. Um, I guess the importance of testing every variation changes. So, look, uh, in a car, an emergent behavior might mean a crash, mm. you know, and we see recalls of cars mm. for whatever yeah. reason. Fine. I mean, some may lead to, I mean, there's been some emergent behavior, I think, with Teslas, right? So they've had to have recalls. Yeah. Because um, they're trying to do something so complex with yeah. self driving. Like the complexity has got bigger. So the, the emergent behavior is good and bad, have got more numerous, right? Trolley problem. Yeah. 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 yeah um, exactly. But at the same time, most of the time, yeah, or, or crashes aren't necessarily always fatal. But when you're dealing with a rocket, or a space rocket, or a missile, or an aeroplane, um, you could, an emergent behavior could lead to hundreds of deaths. Yeah. So there's a different scenario, maybe different regulations about what you've got to test for. Yeah, I, I think what you're talking about is like, there, there's a kind of intrinsic hazard where like blasting yourself into the stratosphere at 500 miles an hour is really dangerous because humans can't survive in that environment. Yeah. So if something goes wrong, you're you're screwed. But... Uh, if you engineer it incredibly carefully, it, it remains fundamentally hazardous, but in reality, it's it's very safe because of just how well designed and controlled stuff is. So I, I think you're talking, there's the difference between, and like, you know, cars are safer, they're lower speed, they tend to, if your car engine cuts out, it'll just stop, right? Mm. So it tends towards a much more like kind of safe, low energy situation. So like the fundamental hazard of flying versus like driving is way higher. And I think that's what a lot of people who are afraid of flying quite correctly observe they're just like this doesn't seem safe because it's not it's really hazardous they're scared of catastrophe yeah yeah because because there is much greater potential for catastrophe yeah but the if you engineer it well you can mitigate and flying flying is the safest part of your day you're more likely to be hurt falling in the shower or driving to the airport you get on the airplane you're actually safer than anywhere else so that that's the extent to which engineering like good systems engineering can change this stuff right does regulation affect this as well? Do, do, you know, depending on what you're engineering near, and there's going to be a lot more involvement in the regulators to check that you're following certain procedures. I think, I guess, nuclear power plants is a great example because we know it takes 10 to 20 years to build one because mm. most of it is regulatory yeah. requirements. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think there's a big, like, don't trust verify thing, like, playing out at Boeing right now, where they, they're, they're allowed to take a lot of the regulation in-house and then it appears that their safety and quality has really suffered as a result. So it's, you know, it's, it's even a free market thing of like, there, there are certain things that customers are not equipped to assess on their own. Like you, you can't crash test your own car. You, you can't, you don't know how safe a plane is. And actually, if you get on an unsafe plane, you only make that mistake once. Like you're not around to learn from it. So there are certain things that like the free market won't correct and, and you absolutely need a regulator to do it. And Well, that's interesting in the world of Bitcoin is because there's a certain cohort of Bitcoiners who are anti-government everything, yeah, anti-regulation, for sure. free market. But I'm kind of, well, they're not perfect, but I kind of like the fact that uh, uh, air travel and aircraft construction is is regulated. Mm -hmm. I like that uh, nuclear is regulated. Even if it feels heavy-handed, um, I feel like there's certain things with a base set of rules or a base set of regulation certainly leads to better safety. And I think Boeing, the Boeing situation has kind of exposed that. Mm. What was your read of the whole Boeing thing? Do you know, I don't know enough about it. Right. I've, I've only, I've been reading a few articles and like, I don't really have any more knowledge than anyone else. But yeah, it, it, it appears that it's, you know, it's, it's money over over safety, over the long-term health of the business, I think, as far as I can tell. Right. Um, but yeah, to be honest, like if, if, you, if you can show me a, like a safety-critical machine, something where it's, it's really dangerous if it goes wrong, if you can show me a safety-critical machine with no regulations on it that never fucks up and hurts people, I'll, I'll be really surprised because I, I, I don't Big think coin. anyone's ever... Well, yeah, <laughs> right, okay, yeah. Um, this is, this is kind, of, kind of how I got onto it. So... Um, 
but Bitcoin's different. Like it's not a it's not a mode of transport. No, but it's um, something we talk about a lot is like dynamic stability. So that that's what we would say. But it basically means like something that is in motion. So whether it's like an airplane or like software that is conceptually in motion, or the economy which is in motion, like is changing minute by minute. Um, if it has dynamic stability, it will take disturbances, like your car will go over a bump and it will recover from it. It'll, it'll feel the bump, but it'll maintain its course and go back to where it was. It'll, it'll settle down. Um, and I, I think that's really relevant to, to Bitcoin and the economy. That was, that was how I first began to understood it, uh, began to, to understand it. And that was how I first kind of got into it, um, seeing all the similarities because, um, Bear, bear with me a minute here. I, I okay. want to I want to explain another like engineering concept. If if I can put you in my shoes, I can take yeah. you back to like 2011, 2012 and kind of show you how I saw it back then. So um, we've got the notion of emergent behavior, right? Mm-hmm. And dynamic stability, where if there is a an external disturbance to the system, like if your car goes over a bump, uh, does it get damped out? Does it settle back down, or does it start a runaway behavior? Right. Mm-hmm. And turbulence. Uh, yeah. It's damped out though, right? Mm. You feel it. The the plane it bumps up and down and it self corrects. A plane is dynamically stable. If the pilot takes his hands off the controls, it'll keep flying forwards and it'll go through turbulence and it'll move about a bit, but it'll keep pointing the same way. Mm. Same way if you take your hands off the steering wheel of, of, of your car, it keeps going in a straight line, right? Mm. And we spoke as well, you you used an example about darts. Yeah, a dart a dart has really natural like mechanical dynamic stability. It's it's got the weight at the front and the drag at the back. So if you throw a dart backwards, it'll flip around and face forwards. And and that's just like that's just a bit of engineering so that no one's controlling that dart, you know, no humans intervening, but it, it will always return to the same stable state, right? No matter what you do. Hmm. An example of the opposite of that, so dynamic instability is a system that it just doesn't want to stay where it's put and it will always go to a runaway behavior. So an example will be like balancing a football on the tip of your finger. It will just fall off, right? And it will fall off one way or the other way. It's, it's really hard to keep it there, right? So it's dynamic instability. You you try and not design anything that has that in engineering because it's it basically in the mach- it means the system will go dysfunctional under certain circumstances, which can mean really bad things for things like airplanes. Uh, not so much for guitars. Like that is you know that's instability there when you get the feedback, but you kind of work it into a concert. But isn't that a nuance of a guitar, but not the entire function of a guitar? It's like in certain yeah. systems, like do you. Do you design trend towards stability, mm-hmm. but an emergent instability might be a benefit, but it's an outlier. Yeah, for something low stakes like a, like a guitar, so that it's that's the emergent behavior of the system. I doubt anyone planned for that to happen when they designed the first guitar. Yeah, uh, but it's yeah, it's something it's something you can put to use. Um, but ge- gen- generally, you're you're designing everything towards st- stability. Yeah, for sure. Um, the like in, in anything high stakes, you you need it to be stable because you you don't want a disturbance because a disturbance is inevitably going to happen. You're going to hit turbulence. You don't want that to mean you hit uh, a doom loop, right? Mm. Um, is that is that a, is that like an, an educational concept? Like when you went to university, I assume you studied something like engineering. Yeah. Is that like a fundamental part of engineering? Yeah, yeah for sure. So always, always go for the stability. We do work with instability where you really, really have to. And a, a nuclear reactor is an example, right? So I'm sure you, I'm sure you could probably kind of know, you know, mm. a reactor is held on a point of criticality, right? Mm-hmm. And it actually doesn't want to stay there. It wouldn't naturally stay there. It's like a ball balanced on the tip of your finger. It'll fall to either side. So it'll either go into runaway where it goes critical, and the, the like the reaction sparks more reactions, it becomes a nuclear bomb, or it dies off. The reaction doesn't feed itself, and it, it quickly, the reactor stops working. So it's one of the reasons there's so much regulation, so much cost building a nuclear power plant, because you've got to keep on top of that instability. It will, it will naturally fall apart. It'll naturally explode or melt down or, or die off. So you, Isn't the design for stability around that instability? In that, to generate nuclear power, you need that instability. But the system's design is for stabilizing around that. Bingo. Okay. Exactly. You you take a situation that's very hazardous, like naturally, 
and you you engineer it so that in reality it's very safe. Like reactors, they do hold it on the cusp of criticality for decades successfully. Okay. You know, like you you can do it. Mm. Um, so I think with that stuff in mind, like that that's kind of how I see the world of a, of a complex system. And like I'm not an economist at all. Um, I I can't code. Um, I this was how I first began to kind of understand Bitcoin and the the wider fiat economy. Right. So. With that in mind, try and kind of like hold that stuff in your head mm -hmm. and transport yourself back to 2011. Mm -hmm. So I graduated uh, with a degree in aeronautical engineering from the University of Glasgow. And I graduated straight into recession, really bad job market, and I managed to get something uh, in Stevenage, actually. Not That's not far from me. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Rivals? I don't know. Uh, so the, uh, the Stevenish ladies are in our ladies division. Right. Uh, Stevenish men, I think are league, they might even be League One now. More league two. I think they're League One. I think they went up last year. So I know one of the directors there, actually. It's right. not far. It's a 45-minute journey. It would yeah, be yeah. considered a, a d derby of such in the higher leagues. Yeah. We might have gone to an Ikea in Bedford when we lived there. Do you we don't have, have an Ikea? We, no, there's one in Milton mm. Keynes. We're too small for an Ikea. Oh, that might have been it. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Like I, I moved down there with my, with my girlfriend at the time and... Um, on the one hand, I, I was really excited to start my adult life. Like I was, I was really done with student life, and I was, I was looking forward to like building a home and uh, just becoming like a, a real person. And so I'm, a, I'm a really boring guy, by the way. Like genuinely, I can tell. All I, right, it comes across. <laughs> all, all I want in life is like a kind of Homer Simpson lifestyle. I, I, I just wanted like a wife and, and a home, and probably a couple of kids, and that's, that's as Simple big life. as I dream. Right? Yeah. Um, and. You know, that that didn't happen. And it's Southeast England and starting on a graduate salary, like the money didn't go far. I was I was still living like a student and uh You're in Hertfordshire as well. Expensive place. To yeah, live. it was it was it was spenny. Um and I, you know, that didn't bother me because it's like, you know, you gotta you start at the bottom, you work your way up and that's what everyone says, like good education, good job, and just give it a few years and you'll be fine. So I wasn't worried, but um Look, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm kind of neurotic. I, I don't like uncertainty. So, hold on. Specifically, what had what had clicked that you couldn't do? You just couldn't afford a house because you found the. You found yeah, the I, I was I was living in a bed sit and I I didn't have any money left over. Like I couldn't afford a car. Like me and my girlfriend couldn't afford to like live alone. There was there was no chance of us like saving up to buy a place. So, but there wasn't like okay, this is just that start shitty bit. In a few years, my salary will get to here, and yeah. I can save a deposit. Well, that that was that was what I assumed. But I wanted, I wanted to, I put together a model to figure out when that would happen because I was impatient. Because I, I was like, will this be six months before we can do this or like five years, you know? Uh, so it, it didn't click till I did that. I, I set about putting together a little model of like our household finances um, over time and, and my career at this place. So I tried to map out a couple of decades. So I got, I spoke to a few like senior colleagues and I, I asked like, like, when do people get promoted? When do people progress? I got a copy of the, um, the salary bands. So I could put together a rough range of like what I was probably going to earn over my career. And it, it looked like a really kind of long, shallow staircase because like CPI inflation was really low back then, but our pay rises were lower. They were all okay. below inflation and you had to get promoted to earn any more money. So that was my income. And I needed I needed to figure out my savings, so I wasn't saving anything back then. But I kind of knew what life was costing me, and then if I knew what my income would probably be, I could figure out a like rough range that I could save over time. And then the final thing was like that that lifestyle, that kind of Homer Simpson lower middle class life. How much does that cost me? And the the dominant factor in something like that is is going to be getting a home. So I just looked at like starter homes in the area, and in the UK you need. 10% for a, for a deposit. So that was my my kind of simple target. And I knew that number changes over time. Like house prices, I think in 2011, they were, they were going up like 10%. They were still, it was a number that changed. So I tried to add that to the graph, like a range of house price increases. So I wanted to know at what point these lines uh, cross each other, right? Because that was the point where, yeah. where I am and where I, mean, I want to be are, yeah. are the same thing, yeah. Um, and I had this big old shit moment because they didn't cross each other. Like, <laughs> nowhere near. Um, my, my income, where I was going to be, was this like really shallow linear thing. And where I wanted to be, uh, I saw it, it's an exponential. I recognized it straight away. It's, it starts off as a really shallow curve and then it really picks up and it gets steeper and steeper until it looks almost vertical. 
I, I had this kind of oh shit moment where I was like, I, I'm actually never going to get anywhere. Like it looks as if, I mean, my pay is going to go up. I'm going to get more skilled. I'm going to get, I'm going to get more money. But compared to the this life I want, I'm going to get further and further away from it. Do Do you think you were looking at this like a systems engineer? Because the way I would have been back when I first wanted to get a house, similar position, I would have been like, uh, I don't have any savings. Um, I want to buy a house. I better start saving and I would have just started saving and then hopefully at some point I'd k- check it back every few months can I buy a house and like, hopefully I'd have got there at some point. I never would have de- I don't know about you no, but I, I never, never would have designed a like system. That, no. No, really. <laughs> and, and the truth is the reason I got to jump the step is my dad said you need to buy a house and he lent me a deposit. Right. Okay. So I had that. Without that I couldn't have done it. And I, I well it's not I feel I know for my kids there's probably a very similar scenario these mm-hmm. days. But I wouldn't have looked at it. I wouldn't have drawn a graph. I just would have said, work harder, earn more. I'll get there at some point. Yeah. That's, and I think a lot of people would have been like that. Do yeah, you think for because, sure. Because you're a systems engineer, you looked at the system. Yeah. You, 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 don't, you don't just throw together a car and, and be like, I wonder what this thing is like. You, you plan ahead and you, you try and like predict and model and you, you design it, right? Do you know what? It's, I think that's obviously very interesting. I think there's another model now that exists that I would love to see. It's the people who've got on the ladder and uh, how they're, they're now being fucked in the other way. Mm, yeah. And they potentially hit a point of not even being able to afford to stay in the house they're in. Yeah. Mm. Like they, they made it into the lifeboat and now the lifeboat has a hole in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. So, yeah. so uh, did you figure out, was it like a year? Was it like 10 years or 15 years or never uh no never it was never yeah well like i I just mapped this thing over decades and it was never systems engineers need to be paid more i I know i keep saying this (laughs) this is the problem peter yeah you're a smart fucker. i said that at the time it didn't work and you explain this to your then girlfriend now wife yeah well like it, it was hard because i didn't know anything about the economy and um no one else was talking about it and I didn't. I didn't know if I'd made a mistake or like if I was too pessimistic or like I. I didn't. I wasn't really able to back myself. It was just like I threw this thing together and it says I'm fucked, but like no one else seems worried. Like, sorry, go no, on. go on. Go on. You finish. I was going to say the opposite. Like house prices going up were a sign the economy was recovering. Like people were like, oh, thank God, you know, like we're we're going to make money again. But it's really a sign that things are broken. Yeah, yeah. Well, I Those I was just rises. like I'm, but I'm on the other side of this. Like this isn't good news for me. Like, you. you, you we're, Everyone's talking about how great it is for the UK, but it's 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 a change that was that was starting to happen that was not going to work out in my favour, right? You're constantly being priced out of that trade. Yeah, mm. exactly. And so was this something that was really dominating dominating your thoughts at the time? Like no, because I I just didn't have enough knowledge to be that confident in it. But it was it bothered me. It was kind yeah. of a red flag, and I I had this thought swimming around of like I might need to do something different like people might be wrong I, i've got data here that is going against the kind of rule of thumbs just the, the thing we've always done and it, it suggests traditional wisdom might be wrong here but know? outside of bitcoin if you're not into bitcoin it's just like oh this annoying thing i'm in my own little world if yeah. you're into bitcoin you've got a whole group of people understand this you can just communicate with them they get it and where, where did when did bitcoin cross onto this uh it was it was after about a year so i got i got sent to bristol with work for a couple of months and like bristol's a really it's a really fun city yeah. and i definitely made the most of it and um i remember i, I was at i was at a house party it's all it's butterfly effect stuff like like everyone yeah. right I was, I was at a house party i was chatting to a cool guy that was big on like the rave scene in bristol and he was telling me about it like what the modern rave scene is like and like one of the things he said was like look i i don't have a drug dealer anymore i uh there's a second internet that's secret and it's like Amazon for drugs and you just buy it using these anonymous tokens and it gets posted through your door. And that sounded like absolute bl- like Blade Runner shit to me. Yeah. It was absolutely insane. And You know it's the same for me, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Love but everyone must kind of stumble across this in, in a way like that. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, right age, right time, right generation, yeah, yeah. right uh, problems with the drugs trade, like fix the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you're like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like I, I looked into it the next day. I was just like holed up in my flat, really hungover. Couldn't really leave. So I was just reading about stuff. And I, I decided to see if this guy was bullshitting because it sounded like, it sounds crazy. But she, yeah, sure enough, like there's a second internet and like you could buy drugs in it. There are these things called Bitcoins that are like, it's like anonymous money. And um, I think... 
I, I wanted to read more. Just get, like you're curious about yeah. these things, right? And like it's new technology. I work in technology. I just I wanted to read more. And um, I guess the, the double spend problem is kind of the first thing you notice, right? I was just like, no, I'm not smart. No, oh, okay. <laughs> no. Well, like you, you kind of from first principles. So I was reading about it, and it's like, right. So I have to send. I have to do. Back then, it was a bank transfer to like a complete stranger. I have no recourse. They're gonna what like email me a picture of coins that they could like copy and paste and then I have to give that to another complete stranger who's going to honor it as if it has value and then they're going to post drugs to me like this <laughs> isn't going to work they're just going to yeah. run away with my money that's because you I think you, did you say 2011-12 uh, yeah yeah so I was 13 so we had local bitcoins which kind of fixed part of that and it was still a trust yeah but it, it was an escrow that. yeah yeah ah oh, that was it was crazy and um yeah, I mean, clearly this this guy this guy that I'd spoken to had used it, so it, it did work. So I kept I kept reading about it, and like it's taken me years to get my head around it. But I, I first kind of understood it as BitTorrent, but for money. Yeah, because I'd used BitTorrent, and I get the idea of like a decentralized network, and you still have integrity of data, even though no one's in charge of it. And um, I, I I tried to get my head around like the blockchain decentralization, securing it with cryptography. And I think my my first my first reaction was like, if this works the way I think it does, the way people describe it, this is going to change the world. Okay, absolutely. Why? Which bit? Where would you? What had clicked? Because so, I didn't look for context. I didn't get it. Right. I was just like, this is cool. I can get drugs. Yeah. Delivered on my door, and they're really good quality. This, this is the bit that's going to make me sound really smug and that's not my intention. Like, um, it, it seemed obvious because I, I didn't, there, there's no way I could have predicted where Bitcoin could go. And uh, I, I had no experience in anything like that. But I thought, all I need to do is predict where it won't go. And so you got 8 billion people on the planet. They all use money, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a technology that has complete appeal. That's, that's really rare. It appears to be unique. It's you know it's not issued by a bank. It's it's censorship resistance. That it's it's brand new. Everyone could potentially be a user, and at that point, like it was operational. You know, for me, like something that has been up and running. It's not just a theory. It's not just some like prototype. It is. It's been operational for years. For for me, that's a mature technology. You know, so it just my thought pro my thesis was just this thing clearly works. Eight billion potential users unique tech, what are the odds no one finds anything, any use for it? What are the odds that 8 billion people are all just totally unable to find any utility with it? And it, it seemed really unlikely, especially because I'd met a guy that had used it. So for the technology reasons rather than the economic reasons? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'd like, I, I had no idea about the economic reasons. Yeah. And so as a systems engineer, <laughs> looking at this, what wowed you? Uh, so that was, because I, I tried to kind of like, I don't know, risk assess it and understand it and... Because I, I can't code, so I can't. I couldn't check the code for bugs. I had to take it at face value, and I, I didn't know how it would affect the economy because I had no idea how it works. But I thought this is a complex system, and it has. It's going to have emergent behavior. It fits in with the economy. I can have a look at this because actually there might be stuff. There might be negative emergent behaviors, like on your electric guitar, where like everything works, the code still executes, but maybe you can still push it into dysfunction. Maybe you can still push it down a, into a runaway behavior, right? So I kind of thought like I can have a look at this and, and kind of satisfy myself that that it's stable, that it that it's going to be around. It can hit bumps in the road and and stay on course, right? Hmm. So I I started looking at that stuff and like. I know you guys are going to be so familiar with this, but let, let's let's like check the big inputs and outputs for dynamic stability. So, firstly, you have to accept that this thing is gonna it's gonna take hits because you've got to connect it to the yeah connect it mm. to the real world so people can write in the blockchain so they can transact. You've got to have people mining so it's limited by energy so it's scarce. So you can't just have one copy sitting on someone's computer where no one can touch it. It would make things easier, but it'd be useless. So it's going to take disturbances from the outside world. There's nothing you can do about it because it's decentralized and it's permissionless. So you have to assume that you know people are going to fuck with it as much as they can. It's going to take the biggest disturbances. Will it recover like your car going over a bump? Will it recover to stability or will it run away like a ball balanced on the top of your finger, right? Like Terra Luna. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh -huh. the, the, I I would say that a lot of the technologies that aren't Bitcoin or or the Bitcoin blockchain 
don't have that stability, mm. right? So, and you see that like depegging of things. It's, yeah. it's where you can you can very quickly force something into runaway, and that happens in like seconds or milliseconds. Yeah. So, uh, mining. You let's say someone adds a bunch of hash rate, right? A whole bunch of a whole bunch of miners come online. It will disturb the system because it's linked to the supply of Bitcoin because it, it has to be. Otherwise, you wouldn't mine. If it didn't affect the output of it, there'd mm. be no point in doing it. So Bitcoin's going to go over a bump. Uh, it, will, it will affect the outcome. But then you've got the difficulty, which is like the suspension that brings it back down periodically. The difficulty right? adjustment is designed for stability. Yeah. Huh. Right? So that is dynamic stability. That is a system in motion. That will be. It'll hit turbulence. It'll be pushed around, and it'll always go back to a neutral point, right? So you know that that really. I was chuffed to see yeah. that. I, I I kept on going. So transactions, uh, like transaction volume, same thing. Uh, you can't stop people transacting, but you have the transaction fees, which is not a hard limit, but it's that kind of elastic car suspension behavior. It. it incentivizes people to be to be efficient and selective move to layer two uh so you you have like unlimited transactions but you you have this dynamic stability the stabilizing force right um what else we've got uh energy so the, the the interaction because you have to buy real hardware and real energy and you get bitcoins that have a value that relationship means Firstly, there's a ceiling on uh, the energy that you use. You're, you're not going to mine if it's not profitable, and because your your profit increases uh, if your if your costs are lower, it's that elastic behavior that brings back energy use to the lowest possible levels. Right? You you always go for the cheapest energy. So dynamic stability there. Uh, participants, most systems. So whether it's like a telecoms network or like business. If you have more more nodes in it, more participants, it becomes more ungainly. It becomes it has greater overheads. It becomes harder to manage, and Bitcoin doesn't because you're all running the same copy of the ledger, right? And it actually becomes stronger and more decentralized and more democratic. So that's better than stability. I, I think we, you and me, Danny, we yeah. were saying that's more like anti-fragile behavior, mm -hmm. where actually it, it gets stronger rather than weaker. And you describe that I think as like a uh, more of a biological trait. Yeah, this is. I, I don't say that to people a lot because I, I think I sound like a crackpot when I say it. But <laughs> no, say it. No, you don't. Basically, so the the anti fragile thing, like any any inert thing in nature, if you if you stress it, it tends to break, right? And you know, if you think about the ring pool in a coke can, yeah, yeah. it's really hard to break in one go. You wiggle it back and forth, it fatigues and breaks, and that's just that's entropy. That's a it's a law of the universe, and the only real thing that fights that is life, right? Like if you stress a muscle your muscles actually get stronger over time. So life goes against entropy and life is anti-fragile. And I think you can make an argument that, that Bitcoin does that as well, because actually as it, as it gets bigger, it gets more valuable, it gains utility and it gets stronger. Mostly like if you build a, a telecoms network, it's going to get bigger and more valuable, but it becomes more vulnerable. It becomes harder to manage, right? And Bitcoin doesn't do that. So I think it's different. And yeah, I, I'm not saying it's alive, but it's, it's so got, people often often describe Bitcoin as an organic system. Yeah, it's, it's got qualities that I don't think you would see in any other machine I can think of. So, I'm guessing you assume Satoshi was a systems engineer because of the way it's been designed. I don't know. I I don't know enough about software engineering to tell if it was a master stroke or if he because <clears throat> if any of these if any of these like stable behaviors weren't present, you would find one of them would run away to infinity sooner or later, right? Like, um, yeah, like like a nuclear power plant without without safety controls on it is it's going to happen. So, I don't know if he if he figured it out from first principles that that all this stuff needs to be damped out, all these disturbances need to brought be brought back down. But like, to me, that's incredible, for, especially for a software engineer, because you, like I said, you can make code stable but at a more complex level you can have emergent behavior that's not stable so the fact he nailed this i mean i know i know he developed it from different technologies and there was a lot of a lot of like precursor work to it but the fact he nailed it first time is incredible to me mm. yeah uh although i mean look they're precursors to learn from yeah um 
But it certainly does feel like a a system. The bigger it gets, the stronger it gets. Whereas, yeah, yeah I, I think you could probably almost any centralized system. I, I mean, is that? Do you think that is just a? Uh, is that just due to the nature of decentralization? <sighs> Have you looked yeah. at centralized versus decentralized? The properties that maybe would make Bitcoin stronger because it's decentralized. Yeah, I think. Well, it's all the it's the problems we're familiar with with the with the fiat system. That's what centralization brings you. So there 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 are benefits and there there are drawbacks as well. Like in, in fairness, the fiat system got us this far. So centralization is is kind of a mixed bag. But the the whole decentralized element of it just doesn't it doesn't have these runaway behaviors at all, as as far as I can tell. Um, and I think. I mean, that's it's kind of a good segue to talk about because there there comes a point in your, in your Bitcoin journey, right? We need to talk about the, the fiat economy, and I kind of I started learning about that slowly, and um, I started kind of becoming more concerned because I saw I saw all these like feedback loops and emergent behaviors that were that were bad news, and you know, like the the first thing I realized was like, oh wow, this really is unlimited. Um, and I kind of knew that, you know, and you, like your coins and paper notes like don't actually have value. But uh, I don't know if I thought we were still on the gold standard. Um, but yeah, like I, I was like, right, there's 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 just nothing stopping people printing money or just like changing the balance in your account. It's just we're limited by good behavior of a small bunch of humans. And fundamentally, that, that, that's, that's a really bad idea for from from an engineering point of view, like if you were going to design a nuclear power plant, even if it was stable, if you had a big red button that said self-destruct and you just said like, by the way, guys, don't ever press that. It's a huge liability, right? It's an accident waiting to happen. So that's not a very good system. The fact we all rely on it is, is kind of concerning. The, I think the next thing I noticed was... Um, well, we, we, I guess a consistent part of this is more often than not, the, the weaknesses in these systems are humans. Mm. Because we have a we like, I, when you're designing a system, it's a set of kind of like, when you're coding or building, it yeah. all comes down to binary, right? Yeah. yeah. Whereas hu humans, we aren't binary. Mm. We're kind of nuanced and have a weird incentive model. And yeah, yeah. we have emotions and got personal goals. And some of us are corrupted. Yeah. So we're the weakness usually in systems. Yeah, absolutely. We're and, if, and, and sorry, just to throw into that, maybe, and, and I think that's the thing about Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been, it's a bit like the US Constitution, designed for the weakness of humans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it kind of it kind of shores up the limitations you would have of just like a bunch of humans. Yeah. And actually, that's, it's a huge problem with the fiat system because the control system for the economy is a bunch of humans, right? It's, it's an organization of, of politicians and central bankers and legislators. And so, look, the, the first problem is it, it's way too slow for, for what happens to the economy because crises can hit it really fast, you know, like war and natural disasters and flash crashes. And how quickly can a, can a human system, can these people respond to it? Even if they're not corrupt and they're, they're acting in good faith, how fast can they legislate when a, when a problem hits you? They can't do it in real time. Mm. So imagine like a plane that can crash in a matter of seconds and you're not allowed to pilot it in real time. There's a, there's a committee that meets once a month to decide what to do with the plane, you know? It's it's just another, I don't really know what to call it. And I'm not making a political point. I'm just saying they, they can't possibly steer the economy in real time. It's so often going to be doing stuff in retrospect. Like a crisis hits you, you just get blindsided by it, and then you have to try and pick up the pieces, right? And that's the that's the limitation of the human system. It can't do this stuff in real time. It can't do it fast enough. Well, you wouldn't want political interference with or political aspirations to uh, to infect system design. No, well, I don't think you could separate them for the economy, the yeah. fiat economy, because it is a political thing. How we run the economy is is often based on the, the politics of the people running it. So I'm not advocating for it, but I'm, I'm saying you would, need to, you would need to do that in real time. You'd need to have politicians like literally passing laws second by second in order to, to actually control this thing. But if you think towards, say, social media, we're seeing what's happening in Brazil right now yeah, where yeah. they're trying... Have you seen all this? Yeah. Yeah. That is... Uh, uh, Twitter is a system. 
and it's now exposed to the weaknesses of humans. Yeah. Whereas uh, if any of those people are on Twitter, if they now move to Nostar, that is a system that's been designed yeah. that cannot be legislated yeah. by a government to censor people and <laughs> restrict yeah. accounts. Remember at the start, you were saying your, your dad was saying the humans are the hazard in flight. Yeah. And he was basically implying hard code them out, right? Oh, this is why the robots are going to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is why the robots are going to kill us. Do you think Bitcoin's going to kill you? No. Right. But the Bitcoin's not AI. No. I think the, the there's no humans. Yeah. Controlling the system. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Well, or lots of humans. I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily saying replace it with another intelligent life form that steers it. I'm just saying, can you can you remove all the steering, just hard code it and have it set and everyone knows where they stand. And I think what you're saying is to get efficiency in like a fiat system, it trends towards centralization. Like if you want to be ultimate, yeah, yeah, ultimately yeah. efficient, you need one person doing everything without committees. And yeah, whereas sure. this is works completely in the opposite. Yeah, for sure. And um, like another, a huge problem that kind of results from the fact that you you have to centralize and you have to act in retrospect like after a crisis is something like you've talked about so much in this podcast that like you're, you're incentivized to print money because you've already been hit by the crisis, right? And yeah. you, can, you can bail out whoever's been hit by the crisis. You can stimulate the economy. You're highly disincentivized to ever shrink the monetary base. Again, like you'd mm -hmm. be unelectable. Like you'd crash the economy today and be like, I know you guys have all lost your jobs, but in 30 years' time, you'll thank me because we're, we're not going to get inflation. So it's really, it's very easy to start down that exponential expansion. Yeah. Put itself as a doom loop. Yeah. And mm. so it's it's technically possible to do it the other way. Like you you could you could shrink the monetary base and like I think I think it did happen in the US a tiny bit recently. But I would say for the control systems, like for the political control system, to shrink the monetary base in like a sustained way to bring us to bring it back to where it was is so improbable that we can probably discard it. I, I would just mm -hmm. say that's never gonna happen. Never gonna yes. happen. We're we're in a, a managed decline. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have a system that only goes one way. It, it, go, it goes to zero, right? I can't tell you when, because I'm not an economist, but I can tell you, you know, that, that's a system that can only head in one direction. That is an aeroplane that can only fly towards the ground. Uh, I don't know when it's going to hit, but it can't pull up. The control system just isn't, isn't there, right? Hmm. Okay, so... So you must... So there's, there's a eureka moment in this view, like... Yeah. Ha, huh, this, you, you connect the two. Yeah. Hmm. Like 20, 20, late 2012, early 2030. I mean, it was gradual because I've learned so much over time, but like my, my kind of confidence built and things did seem to play out like this little model I put together yeah. suggested and I kind of understood more and more like, yeah, okay, if, if I'm on a fixed income in a exponential system, I'm going to get more poor, you know? I, I remember, like, you know the phrase, the rich get richer, the poor get yeah, yeah, poor. I remember, like, there was a point where I was just like, oh, my God, I thought that was just something people said. Like, <laughs> I've actually got the, I've got a graph here. Yeah. I've got the proof. So. Well, but that's what inflation is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Inflation is a, is a driver of the wealth gap. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. That's because it, it, where, where you are in society affects your outcomes, right? Like, fixed normal income, you get more poor over time. If, if you're maybe more middle class, you can store some of your disposable income and scarce assets. If you're really well off, you can play both sides, right? You can, you can play both sides yeah. and ultimately you get richer. Yeah. And it probably compounds because the, the people on the lowest income probably have to sell the assets they have. They'll sell yep. it to the rich folk mm -hmm. who use low interest debt to buy them up. It feeds itself. And like, you know, I, t I take no pleasure in saying that that the graph I put together, I think has been kind of kind of verified by where we are in 2024. And so like that since 2008, the, the bottom 98 or 99% in the UK, their wealth and income has been totally stagnant, absolutely flat. And the top one or 2% has gone up many multiples. So that's the system at work. And that, that's an emergent behavior of it, mm. by the way, because um, no, no one's designed that. We, we don't design the global economy at the system level, we we break up into into countries. There's 190 countries with 190 something governments, however many central banks and legislators and um, you know institutions, and they're all designing you know policies. They're designing components of a machine. Some of them in better faith than others, 
And it's, it's like assembling a car from a chunk of components and no one's ever thought about what you get. And we've built this so Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. So, so, so we have all these components of the economy oh. of which you've got the central bank and government and you know, high street banks and, and there's all these emergent behaviours but nobody's planned for it or is correcting for them. Yeah, exactly. And so they, they actually, there's no correct to stability. It's, yeah. It's to chaos. Yeah. Huh. If I knew, I knew this would resonate. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it, it does. It, yeah. Yeah, and that is, is how you, other emergent behaviours, like Lynn Alden talks about like the, the dollar exporting inflation and the dollar milkshake theory and everything else. Like the, to an extent, you know, in those examples, the US may be taking advantage of it because they understand it. But the global economy, like planet Earth didn't decide to do that. No, no one ever like wrote that down and made it a thing. It's just... It's just what we got. We just assembled this thing and it's what we got. Do, do you think uh, the US Constitution was kind of an attempt, a systems designed to, to correct to stability? Do you know, I, I don't know enough about it. Yeah. I live in Scotland. I've never read I mean, the you know what I mean I by that. I've seen Hamilton. You? I don't know. What do you mean by that? Well, in that we're saying there's these emergent behaviors and the, the the main problem is the decisions of people are humans everywhere yeah and the u.s constitution was the forefathers looking at the weakness of men yeah and trying to plan to build a country to protect against the weakness of man yeah hmm. sure yeah i i think that sounds like an attempt my knowledge of the constitution is genuinely yeah. based on the musical hamilton yeah. uh, but from what i remember it was great that, musical. yeah it was great yeah. and yeah from what i remember it was trying to trying to legislate out almost trying to like hard code out the the rough edges that human system has right yeah yeah huh i think by the way th this is my personal belief that like people people get conspiratorial about this because they you know, they observe, I'm, I'm getting fucked by the system, like everywhere I turn. And it, it feels as if the whole planet is out to get me. It feels as if there must be some malicious force pulling the strings and making all this happen. I think the far scarier reality is there's just no one in charge at that level. There is, we have absolutely not designed this thing at its highest level of operation. We're now all feeling the effects of it more and more in the UK. And it's just, it's just totally unplanned and uncontrolled. And we, we got what we got when we assembled all this stuff together. But, but really, a free market without this interference may... Because the idea of the free market, the free market theory is correct to stability, right? Yeah, yeah. Reach, uh, reach a point of neutrality. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I, I, you know, I think one of the biggest issues is most people don't even recognize this. It's a bit like you said early on where you planned and you create your graph. Me and Danny wouldn't create graphs. We just went, oh, we've got enough money, let's work harder. At some point, yeah, I'll have yeah. enough money to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the reason I can't get people to understand Bitcoin close to me is this kind of erosion of their wealth and this wine of the wealth gap. It, it's slow enough and insidious enough that it just chips away at them. Yeah. And you know, they'll work harder, maybe get a pay rise. About, and they're trying to fight, the, they're trying to outpace the inflation not realizing the game's rigged and they're fucked. Yeah, and, think... and it's a lottery to get out of that. You might get a bit of luck, but most people are going to get fucked. Yeah. And that's that's the problem. Whereas if you go to somewhere like Argentina, where I've been, or Venezuela, oh, they get it. You explain Bitcoin, they're like, I get it. Where do I get it? Yeah. I totally agree with that. And I, I definitely wouldn't have been the person that would have like mapped out the next 40 years of my life. But I think the majority of people who wouldn't do that I think they still feel the same way at the end. I think that's why there's so much nihilism in the world. Because like, even yeah. if they don't have like the data that proves this is going to happen, they still feel it. Yeah. I think I think it's a more recent feeling because inflation has been so high this last two years. Do you think? Maybe, maybe I think it's, I think, I think it's grown. I'd 100 percent agree it's grown, but I think that nihilism has been around for a little while now. Yeah, but I mean, maybe that's a British characteristic that we are second kind of most miserable country in the world did you guys see that <laughs> well I mean look as a Scotsman and as an Englishman I don't think we should call Britain a country <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Should be careful. a collection we're, we're of both, countries you yeah. won't be left back in for a, yeah. Yeah. a collection of enemies and Wales yeah <laughs> um, but 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 I think, I think what I'm trying to say is is that I think it's more recent and I think maybe more people come in. Like inflation is certainly something recently people have been, it's become a discussion point. It wasn't a discussion point four years ago, eight years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. It is now. 
But I think it's the reason why people look and think, I won't be able to ever afford a home, fuck it, I'll buy dog coin. Yeah. Yeah, which is that, but that that's that's gambling or whatever. But even that, but I even think buying dog coin is niche. Yeah, yeah. well, but I think that they'll be open into GameStop or like yeah. it's all it's all of that that behavior. I I think it's manifesting in so many ways because like we've got we've got like the nihilism and people you know like the laying flat movement and people mm-hmm. just giving up on work and moving in with their parents and like mental health and homelessness, yeah, health crisis, people definitely. taking their own lives. Like it's all spiking at the same time. The money's breaking. That exponential is getting yeah. steeper, and. I think there's actually there's a Scottish poverty campaigner called Darren McGarvey who talks about how weird it is that we're we're all you know statistically ninety nine percent of us are feeling the detriment of this system now mm-hmm. and we don't talk about it at all we just we kind of individualize everyone's problems and I think I think you're right we're all experiencing it, it in different ways some people are getting nihilistic some people are developing mental health problems or being made homeless or pushed into poverty or whatever and we just kind of treat that as a problem with like this one person yeah. and it's all coincidentally happening at the same time to increasing amounts of people like we don't talk about the systemic cause right the emergent problems of this system yeah which is now breaking yeah i think it's in a weird way it's maybe unhelpful that I mean, not unhelpful, but like, because because it's happening so slow, and the free market does still exist, so success is still a possibility. Like rags to riches could still happen. It's just becoming less and less probable. It's becoming it's becoming incredibly unlikely. What what are the odds like a a, a kid that is hungry in Bedford right now is going to become a millionaire? Like it's possible, right? But unlikely. Yeah, yeah. And I think that kind of keeps us on that like neoliberal treadmill, right? Because we're we're just like I, I could succeed. Like if you were, you you play football, right? If if the playing field was was getting steeper and steeper and tilted against you, and you're trying to kick this ball uphill, you might be like, well, the goal the goal is still there. I can still kick it uphill into this goal. Yeah, Leverstock Green, that's their pitch. <laughs> oh right, okay, yeah, you lost that one. They understand the game, <laughs> man. That's, that's Bitcoin thinking. <laughs> but, but it's boi- it's the boiling frog. Yeah, yeah, this is all it is is the boiling frog, because in Argentina when we were out there, we went for dinner, uh, and they were all telling me they spend about thirty percent. They're all essentially uh, FDs. They spend thirty percent of the time managing their money not to get fucked. Yeah, and it's essential there. Yeah, it's not essential here. Most people are finding a way. Yeah, you know whether it's a combination of some investment, some gambling, some credit cards, some debt, some hope for the future, into their savings. It's all that. Mm. A very small proportion are going, oh, I just need this thing, Bitcoin, because that's the thing that, that's my actual lifeboat. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it's becoming more and more essential as that playing field tilts. So it's what I ended up doing. I ended up like, running my household like a hedge fund and trying to like fend off the detriment of the fiat system and, and stack sats at the same time. And um yeah, like most people haven't had to do that. So what it's making me start to think is like, is this a better way to orange people? Is there a better, or what is Bitcoin explanation to people if you understand systems design? Because that is really interesting. I can see now, if I look at someone like Michael Saylor, he dismissed Bitcoin early on. We all saw the tweets. But then he got it. Then he got, when he got it, he so got it. Yeah. Because as a systems engineer, it's almost like he can see the world slightly differently than from the likes of uh, Danny and I. Same with Lynn. The fact that they get it and then they so get it, it seems very similar to you. It's like you got it and then you're like, oh my God, I so get it. Yeah. Look, if, if you conceptualize this thing, you, you said it yourself, you've got, <clears throat> it's a, a system that's always going to tend towards zero and it's unstable and it'll boom and bust and it'll shake everyone down. It only goes one way. Or you got something that is dynamically stable and it, it, it won't do that to you. So... One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, wh- which would you rather be in? And um, I mean, to be honest, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a normie, right? Like, I, I live in suburbia, and I, I, I have a mortgage. I have a day job where I mine fiat. So, I don't just want to do the into the wild thing and like reject society altogether. But what a film! I, <laughs> you had to take us into films. I've never seen it. You've never seen it? No, oh. I know it by reference. <sighs> have you seen it? Sorry. There's a boy in there. It's one of his favorite films ever, if not his favorite film. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Uh, um, the fi- uh, a mind-blowing film. You have to watch it. I'll, I'll also, watch an it incredible soundtrack. 
Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam wrote the soundtrack. Oh, no way. But it's, it's an incredible film, yeah. uh, which had a emergent problem. I'll tell you. Oh, no. I, okay. I you need to watch I it. i to watch it. Drop now, me yeah. an email. There was an emergent problem. Right. Sound. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. This is one of those ones I'm like literally repositioning myself entirely during the interview because I'm like rethinking my whole mental model. Yeah. But it's certainly now a way of like, I'm, try- I'm, I'm literally trying to think if I got somebody there, if I'm sat with my friends, I'm trying to explain to them Bitcoin. I almost want to say, look, Bitcoin is a system mm-hmm. and it's with these inherent problems that cannot be fixed. That means we're in this managed decline. Yeah. Look at the signals. And now we have this other system. So, so what are the emergent things that have come from Bitcoin? You're like, that's fucking amazing. Like mining. The way yeah. mining has, what mining has mm. become is an emergent, it's like an emergent benefit. Mm-hmm. Like the connection to the grid. I yeah. don't think Satoshi thought, eventually we're going to get ASICs and cool. these ASICs are going to stabilize energy grids. Yeah, and we'll, we'll reduce carbon. We'll, yeah. we'll burn methane to do this thing. Yeah, no, that, that's incredible. Um, the, going back a bit, like your, your question on orange pilling people, I've I've still never found a way to do it. Like I, similar to you, like everyone talks about the what they're up against nowadays, and then as soon as I mention Bitcoin, they're just like, "Oh, you're a crackpot, yeah. right? Okay, oh, yeah, scammer." Yeah, it's it's really hard. It's really hard to do. Um, the I love the the fifty one percent attack. So the the kind of beautiful circular argument of because you need skin in the game if you're gonna. If you want to dominate Bitcoin and, and and bring it down from within, so as soon as you become the dominant player, you become the dominant victim of your own attack, and that is this. It's just an incredible, like stabilizing force of a circular argument. I know there's there's like non financial reasons you'd attack Bitcoin, but it's like as soon as you can do it, it, just kind of gets reflected back on you, and that's not it's not through. You know, it's not through the traditional ways of securing something, of like keeping something secret or, or encrypting something or keeping someone out the bank vault. It's keeping the bank vault completely open so that anyone can walk in, but anyone that chooses to attack it is, is kind of reflected back at them. And that's incredible to me. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a beauty there, honestly. There's a thing we keep bringing up or talking about within Bitcoin is that you kind of, you can't stop it, Right. Every time, it's like yeah. you stand in front of the stream, you try and stop the stream, it routes around you. Yeah. As a piece of systems engineering, I guess that's only possible because it's decentralized. And is are there inherent properties to decentralized systems that 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 mean there are like almost organic systems that you cannot kill? Um, like the, the, you, you're you're yeah. removing that single point of failure. There, there must be because I, I've I've seen you know that whenever anyone bans Bitcoin, I've seen people say it's, it's like banning the alphabet or banning songs or something. It's just well, what I mean is like if we go back to the airplane, yeah, the, the, the airplane, airplane, um, when you're looking for single points of failure to build mm-hmm. redundancy, but the redundancy of Bitcoin is the decentralization. Sure. Yeah. Um, Am I correct with that? Not 100% sure what you mean. So okay. with an aeroplane, you have like you seven mean. redundancy systems. Yeah. So if the electrics fail, the hydraulics fail, whatever fails or an engine fails, it can still fly mm-hmm. and you can land the plane. But there are redundancy systems built in. They're like, if this happens, do this. Yeah. yeah. But Bitcoin doesn't need those oh, redundancy systems. Yeah. It needs decentralization mm-hmm. to not... To, to to beat those single points of failure, I get you. So it, it doesn't need like in an airplane, you need you need the the redundancies, you need integrity of them. Yeah, they've got to stay in one piece. If they break, you're screwed. But with Bitcoin, you you don't because everyone's got a copy of it, and everyone that involved is incentivized to keep it. Mm. You d- you don't need to put so much effort into maintaining the redundancy. You can just kind of forget about it because the right incentives are there, right? Yeah, is that what you mean? Yeah, hmm. and I also want wonder also. Does Bitcoin work if we don't have a broken fiat system? The code would execute, right? And it would it would still have a hard limit. It would you'd still have the declining lock rewards. If we had constitutionally yeah. had a hard limit on, on the pound. Well, mm-hmm. is gold is it better than gold? Yes. But for te- technology reasons. Sure. But that's But I'm, I'm saying that I'm comparing it to the pound. Say the pound was scarce. Yeah. It was constitutionally protected fixed limit. Is it limit. censorship resistant? And it would say it was censorship resistant. I'm just saying it had those properties. 
would Bitcoin be required? Is Bitcoin like an antidote? Is, yeah. is Bitcoin the, the redundancy system to fiat now? I wonder if it might struggle to compete if, if yeah. there was something that was just as good. Because I, I think I think the the notion of it competing with the fiat system is is incredible because there's now there's a kind of floor on like the minimum standards you would expect from value, from money, right? And well, wh- well, innovation comes from improving things that are broken. Yeah. If fiat wasn't broken, then, it, yeah, there's no need for Bitcoin. But is that question not like if fiat was Bitcoin, would Bitcoin be better than Bitcoin? Because you're saying yeah, if fiat had all yeah, the properties yeah, of Bitcoin, it just is Bitcoin then. Yeah. But but it would still be government issued, so they're not century resistant. So then it is better in that way. Yeah, but I get yeah. your point. Like it's yeah. like what safety used to say when he was like the biggest threat to Bitcoin is central banks yeah. in control. The biggest threat to Bitcoin is central banks not issuing new currency and having responsible economic policy. Yeah. 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 Um Okay. So, so, so what did you do with this? <laughs> Once you had this moment, you're like, okay, well, I get it now. Um, I've seen through. So I, I bored my wife to death yeah. over the years. Um, right. What what I did was I had I actually had a real sense of like I'm I'm not going to let this happen to me. I, I yeah. I'm just not going to do it. And if we if we can if we can put a person on the moon, I can resist what the fiat system is going to do to me. So I set about doing that and like it's taken 12 years. Like it was not, it was a really slow process, different time preference, man. I can, yeah. I can attest to that. So basically what, what I did that, you remember the model with the, like my, my income, my savings and the cost of life I wanted. I set about attacking those three different lines. So First one, my my income. So I I was I was at this job, and it it was it was a good job, but I just wasn't going to get richer in real terms. Now I was going to become more skilled and more senior, and I wasn't going to be rewarded for it, right? But the system was outpacing you. Yeah, exactly. So I I had the confidence. I switched industries. I went into consulting, and it probably sounds obvious. It's like if if you want more money, you get a job that pays more. But it was it was getting out of that nominal way of thinking and yeah. thinking in real terms and exponentials, where I was. I was kind of able to to cut off something that just wasn't gonna wasn't gonna get me anywhere. Yeah. It's a shame. I, I think there's a lot of jobs in the UK that are probably like that now. Mm. Like you become more senior and and it doesn't get you. You can't move out from your parents' place. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that, and like income started to go up in in real terms, and we we start to have disposable income. And I looked at savings next. So again, getting out the kind of the fiat mindset, like cash is trash, and like putting money in a savings account that pays zero percent is is pointless when housing's going up ten percent. Mm. So I started I kind of after all this stuff we've discussed, I, I was confident enough to to really stack sat. So I started doing that. And uh I did a bunch of other stuff as well because like I know it makes sense to YOLO into Bitcoin, but also like I've only got one life. So if I get wiped out. Yeah, yeah and YOLO in back in 2012 is very different from YOLO yeah. in, now. Yeah. It was yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, my thesis was just like, this thing's, it's going to be, it's not going to go away and it's going to be big, but I don't know how, so it would be a hell of a jump. Like we do know a lot more about what it looks like now. And was your wife or girlfriend at the time, I'm assuming, yeah. like, darling, are you still putting our money in that Bitcoin thing? Do you know, she, she understands. She, oh, she says it? Yeah. yeah. yeah what, she got sure. it? No, she doesn't share my enthusiasm, but like she, she gets it. Like for, for a while, it wasn't even... It was just a wee side thing I was looking at. Like yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't playing all my money into it. The, the first money I put into it, I got a little bonus at work, and it was enough. I spent half of it taking her out for a fancy dinner. I put the other half into bitcoins. Okay. Best return on investment ever because th- that girlfriend's now my wife, and the coins like I, I still have some of them. So yeah, but if you'd have put that all in Bitcoin, think of, think of the girlfriend. <laughs> think of how many wives <laughs> you could have. Yeah. Yeah. She Although, does. Have a, yeah, she asked me. She's just like, which of those was the better decision? You actually hedged because now she's like, uh, twelve years on, she's like, hey baby, we still got those Bitcoins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I lost them in a uh, awful lot. I know that. Lost them in a deep frying accident. <laughs> yeah, the boating accident on the lock. <laughs> Nessie came up, knocked that boat over. Man, what are the odds? Fuck yeah. So unlucky. Uh, okay, so you attacked, that's two of them. Yeah, that, so yeah, like say I, I did like stocks and shares and gold and commodity altcoins as well. Oops. Shit but yeah, yeah you, you, I, 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 made, I learned some lessons in the way. I, I made some losses, but yeah. I, I started racking up more wins than losses. So, you know, like my, my savings started going exponential. They started compounding, right? 
they started building themselves up, which is what you need to catch up to another exponential. And the um, lines changed. Yeah. Um, and the, the, so the last one, like the cost of the life I wanted, that's more, it's more of a recent thing as our lives, as we've been able to like get a house and kind of build some stability and build ourselves up. Um, I mean, for starters, like things like, things like credit cards or car, car leases and stuff like that. I know conventional wisdom is like try and stay away, but also when you understand you're putting yourself on that exponential, you, you look at it differently. And yeah. It's a bit like, because you're playing the game. Yeah. Do I want a brand new car or do I want a used car and the difference in Bitcoin, you know? So, you know, it kind of gets you thinking differently. And I did the the play I'm like most, most chuffed with was because it's a pure Jeff Booth defl deflationary technology thing. I, I got interest-free loans for um, a bunch of solar panels for my house and a home battery and an electric car. I did that. Uh, post COVID, pre inflation. Yep. When, like, you know, JPay was saying, like, we're not going to have inflation or it's going to be transitory. And I assume, like, you guys, I was just sitting there thinking, like, bullshit. There's no yeah, we knew it was coming. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? So, um, again, it was another, like, the kind of macro knowledge that, that the route was Bitcoin, but I had the confidence to kind of be like, I kind of know what to do here. So, so interest free loan, short fiat, you get productive hardware that, it generates electricity, the value of which is measured in real terms. And uh, like I didn't see Russia, Ukraine coming, but it, it, it helped through that. So that, that was a, that was an example of like hedging away the, the fiat economy, the just getting like getting rugged by it at every opportunity. So we're, we kind of hit that point. I don't know exactly when it happened because it's so kind of subjective, but like, I would say we're now where we wanted to be, which is why I emailed you, because I kind of think like, who helped me get here? You're, you're, you're very welcome. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> I, I, I am serious. Like, you did so, it yourself. The, the truth is, when everyone says that, they did it, you did themselves. Ah, but so much of the knowledge, especially like the later stage stuff, it, it came from from you guys. And the well, it came from the guests. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it didn't like, come from me. If you bought a football team, I'd take credit. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I want to, um, we, we're not, we're not like, we're not millionaires. We're not rich. Like we still have a mortgage. Um, but we, we have so much more like breathing space and like. You're the, outpacing the system. That's the difference yeah, now. Yeah. 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 And there, there's, there's a real liberty there that I think, you know, I, I know the Bitcoin scene kind of errors towards like the American libertarian yeah, kind yeah. of image, which that's not me. And that's not, it's not really how things work in Europe. Here. But yeah, exactly. If if you can if you can walk away if your if your choice is just like do you want this crap job or that crap job or do you want to lose money this way or lose money that way it's not much of a choice. But if you can actually start to if you give yourself a third option of like I don't want either, I want to walk away from this. There's there's a lot of freedom there, and it's it's much more subtle than like having a gun on a desert island where where no one can mess with you. It's it's a kind of like gentle suburban libertarianism there but like it, it's it's hugely valuable to me and it's well it's a shame not everyone can have it when we were when we were out in lebanon um god there was a you went into lebanon no you? Wasn't no one. there was a guy so lebanon is a basket case yeah it's the extreme version of what we're talking about corruption theft hyperinflation it's so sad it's so sad and yes there's some people who've got out of it but we got out of Beirut. In Beirut, there was like these glimmers of hope. We got out of Beirut, went to Zahi. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that correct. Um, and uh, there's almost no one got out of it. And we went to see this family where they had two disabled children and one son who was fully, uh, he had no disability. And he would go to work uh, every day in a factory to earn $100 a month and all the money went to the family. And uh, we talked to him about it, and he was like, there's no future, there's no fun, there's no going out with my friends, there's nothing to look forward to. Like, is it, these fucking motherfuckers, excuse my language, sorry, people who are going to email me and complain, but they deserve it. These evil fucks who not only uh, uh, cause massive inflation by their incompetence of money printing, literally stole the money from the banks and are living like billionaires, have destroyed the current and future lives of so many people. Yeah. It's it's horrific. These people deserve to be lined up and can I say lined up and shot? Am I right? Yeah, you did. Okay. 
lined up and shot because it's a handful of corrupt fucks who have destroyed these people's lives. And it's it's not just the current situation. And the, by the way, when I made this film in Lebanon, right, I made a film about corruption and hyperinflation. Truth, the story, the under, the story that's not being told was this epidemic of mental health problems. Oh. In a country, you know, when, no one's going to admit it. It's a proud country, proud people. You know, this is taboo to talk about it. Yet you've got people just all over the place with mental health issues and killing themselves. This, there's no future. Like the thing about, like you said here, we still have a future. Like my kids, yeah. they want to go to another country and you know, travel or volunteer or go to a good school. It still exists for them. Not for everyone, but it still exists for them. There's nothing in these uh, uh, non-Beirut regions for big people in Lebanon, and even for the majority of people there, there's just no hope. Yeah. And I just could not imagine having no hope, no future. And that's why when Bitcoin, when Sailor says Bitcoin is hope, it sounds a little bit cringy, like yeah, Bitcoin is hope. But actually, it fucking is. Yeah. Sorry for all the swearing. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we're still very fortunate in the UK. And I, I think... The fortune's being eroded, though. I know it is. Well, yeah, we're all headed the same way. And like, you know, I, I, I don't, what, what I did won't be accessible to, to everyone because you, you got to have something to begin with, you know? Um, if, if you're absolutely impoverished, you're on zero, like you probably can't, you can't amass any wealth. You can't, you can't build anything up. So I don't know what to do about that. I don't, I don't have the answers. And like my, you know, my story is not rags to riches because I didn't come from rags and I'd not made it to riches, but it's more of like, a uh, middle class person hang, hanging on to, to the it quality It goes back to what we were chatting to with Freddie New before this, when we were talking about reminding our elected officials that we elected them and they're to represent us, mm. which I think at the moment has been lost. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, I tell you, right now I'm feeling so... Uh, I'm feeling like this real kind of magnetic pull to mainstream, so how do we mainstream the things we're talking about here? Because I don't think this is niche or a theory. I think this is base fact that we're we're in a managed decline of society. Yeah, uh, and we're going to come to the next elections, and people are going to be like, "Oh, conservatives have been so terrible. We better vote in Labour. They're going to change." No, they're not. Yeah. No, they're not. Well, absolutely I'm- not. We're going to have the same shit with a different colour. It's going to be a red version of that. And then they'll do it for eight years and it'll be blue. And it's a managed decline with increasing debt, uh, increasing liabilities for the government, and inc- increasing squeeze, a, 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 a fraction of society, increasing mental health. Uh, it's, everything is breaking. And I don't think it will get fixed till we mainstream this and we get rid of these fucks who are destroying our country and dest- destroying everything. Sorry, I'm getting some... Getting, so yeah, I'm here for it. No, but it's just yeah, like... no, for sure. You, you, I mean, look... Danny knows. I keep saying to Danny, I feel like this career trajectory changed. How do you mainstream these ideas? Like, I can go around the world and keep making Bitcoin shows for Bitcoiners and talk about Bitcoin, right? This is probably the most fascinating, fascinating. I know you were nervous. The most fascinating interview I've done in ages because you've shifted to thinking. It's something new. It's something different. And it's reinforced that belief. It's like, I don't care about having a big Bitcoin show. I want to have a show that tell, teaches as many people as possible one, here is the problem, but two, this is how we have a shift change. Like this is like we have we have to be revolutionaries about this and and try and do it without sounding like nutters. <laughs> yeah, harder than freedom. Luke's. Yeah, I know. God, that's uh, yeah. Maybe we take lessons there. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. Firstly, like the the stuff we've talked about the is it's more what is it is it it's Greg Foss that says like it's just math. Yeah, I, I would say maths. But, um, I'm maths. Yeah, uh, th- this is apolitical, right? Like you, you can bring your your ideology into a maths problem. It doesn't change the answer. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It doesn't it kind of doesn't matter who who you vote for? It does change life in 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 the country you live in for sure. But I don't think it's going to change all this stuff we're talking about uh, the economy because your your ideology just doesn't it doesn't change the maths. It doesn't change the, the setup of the system, right? Um, it's it's the broken incentives of politics, which I, I mean, you explain it. Yeah, Breedlove says it's you're voting for who's going to steal more of people's money to give it to you. Yeah, you know, what idiots are you going to put into power next? But really, it's just completely broken. Yeah, 
There's a there's a, a Scottish uh, either economist or philosopher called I think it was like Alexander Tyler Titler, who said something like a democracy only survives for, for until people figure they can vote large s from the public purse. He basically says mm. when when the electorate realizes it can give itself free money, that's when democracy dies, and I think that's the case. Now I th- I think it's I think we're feeling it now. I there's there's one more thing that. That I think is worth talking about. Like I, I think there's a, I don't know if you call it a feedback loop, but there, there's something like we're we're talking about how to get people to to kind of realize this stuff and start talking about it. And I think you're totally right. Like there, there's no chance of anything like revolutionary happening. Like we're we're nowhere near it, despite the fact 99% of us are suffering under the same system, right? So we understand the maths of how that's happened, but I don't think we understand the psychology of it at all. Like why the hell aren't we doing anything? And I think a huge problem is that we wade into all these things with so much politics and ideology when we should just have a discussion about work and, and money and the economic system. Because because work is so connected to like personal virtue, right? It's, it's the American dream, it's hard work, it's capitalism. And on the flip side, you've got lazy scroungers and cheats and stuff like that. So it's really hard for all these people that kind of experience the problem in different ways from like nihilism to poverty to mental health when they talk about it. All I see is them being blamed for it individually and shouted down. Like you, you get told to eat less avocado, you know, <laughs> even even if you've done everything right. And it's it's so difficult to have any sort of like cool analytical discussion about any of these problems. I saw an amazing example, like... Um, it was a headline about child poverty in the UK, which is, we're up at like almost one in three. Wow. And the, which is for a developed country, that's appalling. It's, it's just, yeah. So you'd think people would want to talk about that. But the, the top comment in, in response to this was a guy with the St. George's Cross's profile picture. And in all caps, it was, um, don't care, English patriot, love my country, end of. What does that even mean? I th- well, I interpret it to mean I don't want to hear that English kids are in poverty because it conflicts with my patriotism. Like, I, I can't hear this bad news, so, so get it away from me because my identity is tied to all this stuff, my sense of nationalism and belonging. And surely a true patriot would be like, okay, I, I want to hear about this. This is really bad news for English yeah. kids. Like, let's, let's focus on the problem and talk about it. And, and you see this all the time. It's the, it's the eat less avocado. It's the shut up entitled boomer thing. Like, you... You just project some sort of like political insecurity on people when we talk about this stuff, and you end up not talking about it at all. Uh, I don't know why you're nervous. That was brilliant. Uh, Thank you. Uh, wow, and I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, and and you know, it's it, like it was it was a tough one because I'm I'm, I'm rethinking a lot of my mental models with this, um, and I, we definitely want to do a follow up. Because Another twelve years, maybe? No, not twelve years. I I want to pair you up with somebody, though. I'm just trying to think who would be sailor. Alan Farrington. I was going to do Alan Farrington. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Will you be able to tell us apart in the audio, though? <laughs> Definitely um, not. Yeah. yeah. What I embroidered. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Look, very cool. Very cool. And thank you for being the first person to come on my show. And I actually think I, I did so a poor much. job because I, I I was rethinking a lot of my mental models with this through it. But there was a lot of kind of like self-realizations about, huh, maybe, you know, like the the difficulty adjustment as a as a system stabilizer. Amazing. Yeah. Obviously, I know it does that. But connecting that to systems engineering and knowing that, you know, one of the fundamentals of systems engineering is stability. I didn't know that because I've not studied systems engineering. So thank you. Uh, where, where should we send people? Have you? Is, is there a published article? Uh, not really. I, I kind of don't do that. I've I've got a Twitter. I'd, I've never tweeted. I've got a Twitter profile. I followed Danny. People can contact me on that. How many followers have you got? Uh, I don't believe I have any. Oh no, I've got a couple of spam bots. And that's the way I like it. Frankly, <laughs> it's my audience. All right. Well, you 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 should. People are going to want to get in touch. Yeah. Yeah, please do. Then they then they will get in touch. So how do you want people to get in touch? Twitter is probably the way to go. What is the handle? I don't know. <laughs> Let me find it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a handle. I know That's that so much. I love you, don't know it. Yeah. It's like Scottish you. Odell. Yeah. It's Godell. <laughs> um, 
Uh, okay, it's ah, uh, oh, this, this is going to be difficult for people. It's at Darth Peebles because I'm from a town called Peebles. It seemed funny at the time. So <laughs> Darth, like Darth Vader, and then P E E B L E S. Great. Okay, sixty one followers. Sixty one followers. Wow, yeah, it's a lot more than I thought. Let, let's see where All you bots. are in a week and how many DMs you get. And uh, look, thank you so much for coming on, Nick, and thank you for thank the whiskey. That's very, you. very kind of you. Uh, I'm probably going to save that for the weekend after uh, the week we're going to have. We'll see you again Friday. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. And that uh, pleasure. I'd, I'd like to do this again uh, at some point in the future. Get me in. That'd be great. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome.